By the middle of the 17th century, London had become the largest city of Western Europe, with a population of around 400,000. By the end of the century, the population had increased to 575,000. Many historians laid the success of the fledgling empire and the growth of the Stuart economy squarely on the success of London. London was at the heart of the road and shipping network as well as home to the new investment banking industry. Although the preconditions for economic growth in London were there under the Tudors, it was under the Stuarts the city saw a boom. Historians writing since the 1970s have generally concluded that there was no monocausal reasons for the growth of London. In fact, growth was a result of a combination of minor developments converging at the same time. London had much to offer. The banking and insurance industries based in London provided employment and capital to maintain merchants and businesses. The legal system, the inns of courts, where legal training took place, were all in the city and the most highly regarded lawyers were in the city. The improved infrastructure of Britain now meant that the Thames was navigable for much of its length. This was very different from many other towns in Britain. The population growth and the change in demographics of London offered a wealth of opportunities making London an attractive place to live and work. If you were skilled or educated, London offered more than a simple subsistence life. Also, the sheer number of markets in London made London the focal point for economic activity in the South East. By the middle of the 17th century, London was dictating the national prices of livestock, grain and cloth. Because of all this, London was the economic, political and religious capital of England, attracting migration from all elements of society. By 1688, London was not just the centre of British trade, but also the hub of a European market relying on the port of London. As trade grew, so did London. The risk this brought created the need for the insurance market and a massive service industry to feed, clothe and provide for the residents and workers of London. The intention of this lecture is for you to consider to what extent the growth of London impacted on the economic development of Britain between 1625 and 1688. Knowledge-wise, you will be able to explain why London became the hub of economic activity. Skills-wise, assess the role of finance in creating a country's power. And behaviourally, evaluate the reasons for economic change. Before the development of banking, goods were traded for cash or bartered for on a like-for-like -like basis. Bills of exchange developed as a form of credit, a form of credit where the purchaser would pay for the goods at a later date with interest. The risk was on the seller when accepting bills of exchange. The interest rates had a legal limit, which decreased over the 17th century, making credit far more attractive. Between 1571 and 1624, the limit was 10% decreasing to 8% between 1624 and 1651 and ending at 6% between 1651 to 1714. Due to the attractiveness of credit, an industry was required to provide it. The first money scribbling firm established by Robert Abbott in London in 1636. A money scrivener is someone who lends money or arranges the lending on behalf of others with a level of security on the loan. In the 1650s, Royalist landowners turned to scriveners for loans to protect their assets and estates from the Commonwealth. Men with wealth were willing to offer their own capital as loans, with Abbott working as a broker. Between 1652 and 1655, £1,136,464 passed through his accounts. When Abbott died and business passed to his nephew, Robert Clayton, his wealth was enormous and his accounts show he received £3,515 per year in interest from loans alone. Clayton and his business partner, John Morris, were responsible for writing the first English cheque in 1659. The second half of the 17th century saw a boom in goldsmith bankers. In 1640, 
Charles seized the precious metals and gems that merchants stored at the Royal Mint in the Tower of London. As a response, merchants moved to using the large private vaults of goldsmiths. The goldsmiths began to lend the money out with interest. In 1670, there were 32 goldsmith bankers in London. This rose to 44 by 1677. The system was paper-based with bills of exchange. They were trusted by other bankers and the historian Stephen Quinn has argued it was because of the guild-based system of apprenticeship. The Howe Commission in 1652 attempted to regulate the finance industry. However, its recommendations were not acted upon. Charles II was heavy in debt to a group of goldsmith bankers who were borrowing money at 6% and lending to the crown at 10%. In 1672, Charles II reformed banking, so all loans were levied from the general public, not the goldsmith bankers, meaning a lower rate of interest. The Royal Treasury confiscated the funds deposited by the goldsmiths and did not refund or compensate them. Any confidence in the crown was now lost until the glorious revolution when William III repaid the original loans. Insurance was central to the expanding empire. Dutch merchants understood the value of marine insurance and used London to meet financiers. However, formal policies were unusual. Marine insurance was brought to Britain in the 15th century by the Italian merchants. In 1601, a marine insurance law was passed to regulate the market and a separate assurance court was created to deal with issues. Merchants were reluctant to use insurance as it was expensive and did not cover the full cost of the cargo. By 1657, Dutch ships were insured, whereas British ships avoided the cost. However, London merchants started to adopt the Dutch method, seeing the risk management as wise. As a result, insurance costs dropped by up to 75% over the 17th century as it became more established. London became the insurance market leader. Coffee houses began to pop up, enabling brokers to do insurance deals. The boom in fire insurance does have the Great Fire of 1666 to thank for a boost. However, it had been around long before that event. Beginning in Prussia, in 1623 with a state funded fire insurance, there are records existing from 1615 for a Mr Havers offering insurance for estates worth up to £40,000. Charles I created a scheme to cover London in 1638, which no doubt fell into oblivion due to the Civil War. An act in 1667 detailing the rebuilding of the city made reference to the settling of insurance claims at the Royal Exchange. In 1681, the Fire Office was established and the Friendly Society in 1683. However, private housing was not covered until 1720. Nevertheless, policies to cover life and accident were unheard of in the 17th century. Insurance was still in its infancy, but it was a central ingredient to the melting pot of the development of the economy and empire. The intention of this lecture was for you to consider to what extent the growth of London impacted on the economic development of Britain between 1625 and 1688. Knowledge-wise, you will now be able to explain why London became the hub of economic activity. Skills-wise, you will now be able to assess the role of finance in creating a country's power. And behaviourally, you should be able to evaluate the reasons for economic change. Now complete the associated material.